thank you very much. I see about 135 participants on the call. So I'm grateful to all of you for joining today. But to start with my gratitude to Khaki Tours and Khaki Lab for uh, inviting me to talk on a subject, a topic that is very close to my heart. A disclaimer, I am a Koja myself, a Koja Ismaili. Um, uh, but uh, you know um, uh, the research uh, that I've been involved in for last almost 30 years now is uh, related to Kojas. Uh, so it, it, uh, it, it's an honor to share some of that with you. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of data, but uh, hopefully I'll try to try to cover some interesting bits and pieces. And I do have a presentation. I will soon share the screen with you. But uh, I wanted to express my gratitude. I see some highly respected uh, individuals uh, that, whom I respect a lot. Uh, and, uh, I, and I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Uh, so my gratitude to all of you. Um, I would not name each one of you here, but uh, thank you very much for joining today. And uh, you know, wherever you are joining in from, I see people from right from uh, Vancouver, Toronto, to all the way, Dhaka and you know Far East. Um, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, almost time to say good night in some part of the world. Um, so thank you very much for that. And uh, let let's get going with uh, with the presentation. So what I've done is I've tried to keep the presentation. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, you know, I'm an I'm a Koja Ismaili. My my research primarily has been related to Koja Ismailis. But uh, Ismailis are not, uh, you know, so, so all Kojas are not Ismailis, uh, one distinction. So once you say Koja, that doesn't mean Ismailis. That means a lot more than just Ismailis. So all Kojas are not Ismailis. But I also want to say that all Ismailis are not Kojas. So you can't just bump into an Ismaili and say, you know, you are a Koja because I see at least two or three of them who have joined who are Ismailis from Bombay, but they're not Kojas. So thank you very much for joining, by the way. Um, you know, uh, it's good to see, you know, Moman Jamaat getting interested uh, in knowing about Kojas. Uh, that, that's really nice. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Um, I've put a presentation together. Uh, hopefully uh, you should be able to see the presentation. Um, so can somebody confirm if the presentation is visible? Yes, it is. Oh, perfect. Uh, <clears throat> and my clock is showing 10 minutes something. So hopefully we should be able to finish it in 50, 55 minutes, and then we'll have some time for question answer. Um, so uh, today we'll be talking about Khojas of Mumbai. And uh, uh, as I said, you know, we'll be talking about multiple groups of Khojas. Uh, so the first question that you would want to ask is like, you know, I mean, Khaki is into heritage preservation, why are we talking about Kojas? I mean, why Kojas and not anybody else? And, you know, so let me let me start by flashing some images that of the people that you know, and I'm sure you know the duo uh, Salim Suleiman. Um, and, and, you know, once you are this famous, you don't need a surname, uh, but their surname starts interestingly with M, uh, which doesn't stand for music, it's merchant. Um, well, why talk only Bollywood? Uh, you have politicians, uh, Amin Patel, whom Mumbai Devi constituent, I mean, you know, voters have elected for the third term. So it seems that, uh, well, disclaimer, I'm not here to promote any party or discredit any party or promote any individual. It's just that I thought that if you've elected him three times, I'm sure he's doing something right and I would bring him here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, Safdar Bhai, uh, as very famously known, uh, he provides cine equipments, lights, again, connected to Bollywood, but also uh, event coordinator, uh, Haji Safdar Karmali, who is head of the Khoja Ishnashri community as well. So, and Dimple Kapadia, and, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much for one of the, you know, I see that's, uh, you know, uh, distant relative of Dimple is on, well, not so distant, uh, relative of Dimple is on the call. And I chose not to put the image there. So it's not an accident. It's a blank uh, square, by the way, uh, because I was in dilemma because, uh, you know, um, I come from a small village. By the time Bobby reached my town, I was 16 and Dimple happened to be 16 in that movie as well. So 
you know that's the dimple that i know uh, you know and um, uh, i managed to watch that movie because my father said you know he you know like this is the movie by my friend's daughter uh, you know chuni bhai kapadiyani dikrini movie che so let's go watch it uh, and uh, yeah that uh, i managed to watch it and then you know I, i i was not sure whether i should put a dimple of today there because that would you know not be appropriate uh, impression for many of us and so i decided not to uh, but when i'm talking about these bollywood and politicians and uh, you know businessmen um, these are not the only ones right even if you talk about bollywood uh, the um, you know there is another salim suleiman duo by the way uh, their surname also starts with m uh, mobani uh, you know hangama Uh, guys you know uh, suleiman mobani is still in bombay uh, salim i understand is in the us now california somewhere but salim suleiman um, you know they 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 were responsible for hangama.com uh, then you have another brothers who also uh, act you know coincidence call it uh, their surname starts with m as well moranis uh, ali and karim morani again connected to bollywood two brothers you know event uh, you know you see this grand uh, award functions uh, organized by ali and karim morani uh, their children are into this as well now um, you know we have uh, mumtaz kotadia's daughter i understand she's into costume design and all that uh, um, <clears throat> a good friend of mine and a brilliant screenwriter uh, a hindi medium fame uh, screenwriter uh, zinat lakhani um, um, Uh, a fine actress from my jamaat khana bandra bazar uh, amreen chakiwala uh, and an amazingly brilliant a uh, storyteller director abbas tairwala um, all these are khojas okay um, uh, i mean yes we do have the names tairwalas and chakiwalas and i saw some uh, chitthi wala uh, on the call uh, you know somebody logged in called chitthi wala um, and uh, we do have uh, uh, daru walas and sabu walas and uh, lai walas and chamra walas and all sorts of walas and yes somebody just texted saying are you related to parsis we are not <laughs> we still don't have screw walas i have not come across any khoja who is a screw wala um, i mean if you are talking about business men then you can talk about uh, yeah i mean finance expert nasser manji yeah, you talk about uh, eagle flask padamsi family uh, businesses like development credit bank uh, you you have like loads of uh, you know khojas that are they are doing amazingly well i mean this is a disproportionate share of success i acknowledge that it's a small community but has had amazing success and i want to also have another disclaimer here you know my as i said you know i I've, i've picked up the examples mostly from the khojai smileys because that's the community i know well but i'm sure if you go to khoja ishnasharis and khoja sunnis you would come across as many names you know because because khojas are a mercantile community and a very successful community but if you guys are like committed to not now but the past you know it's heritage you know talk about the dead so let me talk about the deaths uh, mumbai mayors i just looked at the mumbai mayors and i looked at only 20 years because when i started listing i got tired so i stopped after 20 years 1888 to 1919 uh, about 10 11 years i i mean 20 21 years i looked at and i came across at least six uh, mayors who seem to be uh, well who i know were khojas so imagine six or possibly seven i'm not too sure from you know i put a red question mark on uh, 1902 1903 mulji barbhai <clears throat> now barbhai uh, was the group of people who separated uh, that the first khoja group that actually um, objected to the authority of the imam a living imam aga khan uh, <clears throat> the first um were barbhai so i'm not too sure whether this is a khoja mayor or you know name sounds a bit kind of confusing so i it it, it could be a very good research topic and that's why i've included there uh, i'm certainly going to do it but if anybody in the audience and we have 157 people now wow. uh, if if we uh, if anybody in the audience knows who this mulji uh, i think his middle name was also b barbhai <clears throat> uh, was barbhai was then uh, i would want to know it but 
रहमतुल्ला मोहम्मद सायानी अब्दुल्ला मेहर अली धरम सी वेरी फेमस सर इब्राहिम रहमतुल्ला एंड इनफैक्ट द रोड यू नो इन पिंडी बाजार इज कॉल्ड सर इब्राहिम रहमतुल्ला रोड and then fazil bhai vishram jafar rahmatullah we will be talking about some of these people sir fazil bhai karim bhai ibrahim uh, this is an important uh, individual um, you know uh, uh, and karim bhai family is very important both mukesh ambani and i thank uh, you know uh, karim boys uh, mukesh bhai for uh, getting him a home there uh, and uh, i for getting a wife there you know my gharwali so mukesh bhai got the ghar and i got the gharwali in that space uh, by the way before mukesh ambani moved there there was a karim bhai orphanage uh, uh, on alta mount road and that karim bhai orphanage was a camp site where my wife and i met uh, during our teens i'm married to the same woman for last so many years uh, coming back to um, so you know we have them to la karim bhai there and we have fazil bhai karim bhai ibrahim there so you know the, this community seems to have uh, have contributed to the civil society <clears throat> has contributed to the and i could have listed some poets and some journalists and writers and i can uh, you know I, two names that come to my mind is that you know you know like amazing travel uh, writer you know um uh, samira uh, somani and uh, you know amazing journalist subuhi jivani Uh, and and i can list you know i can list names i can list the authors i can list you know khojas have had uh, you know have contributed to multiple facets of the life of bombay and if you are doing heritage uh, preservation if you are concerned about heritage if you want to narrate the story of mumbai it can't be narrated without khojas and that's the reason we are talking here <clears throat> um, uh, khojas let me let me go still further and talk about you know some names that you may have heard of Uh, chinois you know um yeah uh, they were khojas uh, rahmatullahs and i have a complete story on rahmatullahs that i'm going to do so i'm not going to focus here jeraj boys uh, jeraj bhai peer bhai and you, you would be surprised in fact you know this karim bhai orphanage that i was talking about on alta mount road where today the, uh, mukesh ambani's residence stands <clears throat> uh, and tolia if i'm not wrong uh, whatever the name is but uh, Uh, you know this uh, jeraj bhai was the son of peer bhai uh, khalid dina and uh, this name is important and in the next slide we will be talking about it but uh, <clears throat> you know the museum of uh, you know uh, indian film division uh, on pedal road is actually located on the site which was once owned by <clears throat> peer bhai khalid dina gulshan abad uh, you know uh, or gulshan mahal as it is called now was owned by a khoja family then you of course have karim boys uh, that we have been talking about and karims <clears throat> and and karims are different from karim boys uh, this is uh, I, i'm sure you come across tag brand umbrella uh, ibrahim karim and sons 1860 they started selling umbrellas 1880 they had the factory of umbrellas they once held the record world record for producing the highest number of umbrellas and that you know shop on pai dhuni ibrahim uh, ibrahim karim and sons is has a has a history going back 125 30 years and and that's basically um, the history of khojas let me talk about uh, <clears throat> uh, you know i mentioned chinois and you can see their uh, uh, sir ramtula chinoy of bombay uh, you know Uh, intercepting a ray of sun by relaying signal for opening of san francisco world's fair you know i mean you are talking about a bombay khoja being recognized and you are talking about 1939 um, uh, <clears throat> internationally and ge on their website today have this photo in fact they are taking the credit for it my apologies my throat is little bad so i need to keep sipping water the other image that you see there is sir ibrahim ramtullah <clears throat> sir ibrahim ramtullah was the mayor of bombay 1899 to 1900 uh, was he the only one um, in the family no his younger brother jafar ramtullah 
he wrote a beautiful work in 1905, if I'm not wrong, uh, September 1905. Uh, uh, it was called uh, Koja Kom no Itihas. Uh, I put the English title there, uh, you know, the history of the Khojas, but uh, the original book was in Gujarati and it's called Khoja Komno Itiyas. And somebody from, in fact, Sultan Ramtullah, one of the family members has sent a copy to me. So I'm grateful uh, to Mr. Ramtullah for sending me a copy of this book. Uh, you know, it, it was a wonderful read. 30 small chapters, very concise history from 1905. <clears throat> you know, and you need to go back to that period to understand the Khoja uh, social governance and all that. Um, he, he, he was actually, he studied in London. He returned to Bombay in 1897, uh, joined Bombay High Court. He worked regularly as a barrister. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> one of the major cases that we would be talking about today, Haji Bibi case, uh, he was the only Indian counsel to sit in, you know, on the side of uh, Aga Khan III against whom the case was filed by his cousin, Haji Bibi. So, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, and these guys are not the only people, you know, Jafar Ramtullah's son, <clears throat> Hussain Ali Ramtullah, becomes a mayor in 1934-35. Um, their children, you know, in fact, Hussain Ramtullah's children, um, uh, Shabuddin, uh, if I'm, I'm remembering the name correct, was a famous cardiologist. Uh, he's, he's credited for identifying two uh, important, you know, kind of, uh, I would not call it disease, but uh, heart-related ailments. So <clears throat> you have, um, his other son was uh, also a famous um, uh, physician and became the principal of a medical college. Uh, uh, so, so you have uh, uh, quite a few, uh, you know, khojas uh, reaching all sorts of important uh, uh, positions. Uh, I've spoken about Gulshan Mahal, which was called Gulshan Abad. It's a heritage structure, the current, the National Museum of Indian Cinema. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, so, and I've given, you know, I don't know whether the we we you know circulate the PDF of the presentation, but. If you ever receive the PDF, you would be able to, you know, click on the links that uh, that are there. You can see on the screen in blue, uh, and and read about about these uh, these individuals. <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, if you go to the website of Film Division, you will come across this story. Uh, this beautiful house that you see here is Gulshanabad, where, of course, they have created a new structure as well on the premise. But uh, this is, I think, if I'm not wrong, over 1,800 square feet, uh, square meter building, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, uh, which, which has been donated to the film divisions, uh, films division, uh, to, to have a museum. Uh, it's, it's done by a, um, <clears throat> by a Koja. And I'm sure if you have not seen those buildings, people from, you know, Dongri area, uh, Mazgao areas have crossed this building. This is Diamond Jubilee. Uh, high school, uh, Diamond Jubilee School for boys and girls. Uh, those were established by Khojas and their their uh, leader. Um, uh, you know, the Khoja Khan Muhammad Habib Bhai High School, uh, then uh, Dawood Fazal High School. And then uh, you go, you know, down and you see all these beautiful buildings in Dongri area and, and amazing charities. Habib Hospital, for example. Uh, you, you have uh, you know, I think there is a hospital running in Musa building, uh, and Musa Jafar was was a koja. So the reason I'm telling you this is, you know, the there is not a single street uh, in in that area where you can walk without without coming across a, a koja monument or koja uh, contribution. Uh, in fact, whole of Bombay, you go to Mahim, you go to Bandra, you go to Thana, you go to Kalyan, you go to Dombivali, you go to Panvel, you go to Matheran, you go to wherever you, you would come across, right? From constructing the railroads to, um, you know, providing coal to the, the steam engines, <clears throat> the Khojas, Khoja businessmen were involved. You come across Prince Ali Khan Hospital, Aga Hall State uh, was established in 1945. Um, uh, you know, and, and you, as I said, all, you know, Ismailis are not Khoja, so I don't want to take the credit for... <clears throat> all this Diamond Jubilee School and, uh, you know, uh, Prince Ali Khan Hospital, but 
you know, primarily uh, the, the Ismailis in Mumbai are Khojas. And, and everybody talks about uh, Prince Ali Khan Hospital, but hardly anybody knows uh, about another building that I want to talk about. And I, uh, I saw Vinayak is online as well, and uh, <clears throat> it's good to have you, Vinayak. I uh, thank you for sharing that image. I should have put that image here. Uh, but uh, you know, there is a building called. Uh, it, it's pronounced nowadays. People talk about Rahim Castle, and sometimes Castle. Uh, it's Rahim Castle. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, established as a hospital building, uh, and the first patient lift, a lift which could take the whole stretcher, a, a bed, patient bed, a surgical bed, in a lift, was installed in that building. It's a historically very important building, again constructed by Khojas and used by the Khojas. And of course, when <clears throat> some neighbors objected to having a hospital so close to their vicinity. The hospital was moved to Aga Khan, Aga Khan you know, Aga Khan then had the state, uh, which is called Aga Hall State. And, uh, and the hospital was moved there. That's where Prince Ali Khan Hospital currently stands. In fact, that's where uh, the Aga Khan had his palace. Of course, Aga Khan had his residence at Malabar Hill as well. Uh, in fact, that was sold. Uh, I do have a picture. If we get a chance in the q and I'll show the picture to you, but I've not put it on the slide because there were too many slides and too many things to talk about. But uh, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who have been to that Malabar bungalow of uh, Aga Khan. But I'm talking about a bungalow where now Aminabad, well, I don't know whether Aminabad still stands because there's a redevelopment taking place, but, but there was a bungalow uh, which belonged to Aga Khan, uh, which was there till 60s. And um, so coming back to, uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, um, contribution of Khojas. And as a homework, guys, I picked up this from your uh, just dial directory, Aga Khan Jim Khanna Chow Party, Mumbai 400007. I'm not going to talk about it. The building still exists, I've been told. Go and find out more about it. Okay, so <clears throat> why study Khojas? So give me, let me give you, you know, so we basically what we have done is we, we have spoken about individuals, we have spoken about institutions, I want to talk about sports. Um, Bombay Gymkhana decides to revive all India Aga Khan tournament. It's a hockey tournament. It's the second oldest hockey tournament in Mumbai. I mean, in the country, sorry. It's over 116 year old tournament that was revived. <clears throat> it was stalled in 2006, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and it was revived in 2011. Yeah, May 2011. And uh, interestingly, people who funded the re kind of, you know, started the cup again, were, this is the press release of a bank called Development Credit Bank. Uh, the bank, which again was established by Koja merchants, uh, you know, Masalawala Cooperative Bank, Ismailia Cooperative Bank, quite a few banks were merged and the Development Credit Bank was established. And in fact, Ismailia, uh, Ismailia building, I mean, uh, what is it called? The Dongri building. There is a building where the DCB branch is located. It's, it's I think, called uh, <clears throat> Ismailia Bank building. Yeah, if I'm not wrong. Uh, uh, and and um, that's what um, we need to understand that they contributed to the sports. So I hope I've convinced you why we need to talk about Khojas. Let's see who are these Khojas. So uh, I'm using the, you know, I've used only one article, <clears throat> which is part of this book that you see there uh, by Dr. Farhad Daftari, published by the Institute of Smile Studies, where I work now. He's my director. Um, so Khojas are Sarpanthis. Uh, originally members of small mercantile caste in Western India, when we say Western India, Gujarat, Sindh, that's the region we are talking about, Maharashtra as well, <clears throat> but originally from uh, Kutch, Sindh, Gujarat uh, region. Um, Professor Asani beautifully kind of summarizes who they are uh, by using Faisal Devji's unpublished article. Uh, he says they are simultaneously a Vaishnavite Pant, a Sufi, order a trader's guild and a caste. 
So that's why khojas are pretty kind of difficult to comprehend, you know. So sometimes the people say, well, you are, you know, you believe in, uh, you know, so somebody, you know, when realized that I was doing a talk, uh, sent me a text saying, <clears throat> so you are going to talk about Aga Khanis. Uh, by the way, Aga Khanis, calling anybody Aga Khani is a derogatory term, okay? So that's not the right word to use. Uh, but <clears throat> those who, who, uh, who believe uh, in Aga Khan as their spiritual head, if you are referring to the, that community, they are not the only Khojas. There are multiple Khoja groups. And I've already spoke about Khoja Sunni, Khoja Ishnashiris, and we'll be talking about them. And, and sometimes they say, oh, but, but that means Khojas are like basically a business community, a business traders guild. No, it's not traders guild. It, it, it's caste as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but so you are Hindus. No, we are not Hindus. We are Muslims. Uh, but you have traditions that are Hindu looking. Yes, we do have practices that resemble them, but we'll be talking about all of this. So uh, yes, uh, if you want to know the history briefly, uh, you know, all Koja groups, you know, they would have their version of who Pir Sadardin was. So Kojas would say he was Ismaili, Ishnasharis would say he was a Sufi or Ishnashari, Sunnis would say, well, he was a Sufi Sunni. You know, there are differences, but all of them go back to the, you know, 15th century. Not to say that there were no Khojas before that, or there were no Ismailis before that. In fact, uh, one of the earliest, uh, you know, um, Shi kingdom in, in the subcontinent was Sumras of Multan, who were Ismailis. But coming back to Pir uh, <clears throat> Sadadin, uh, using Professor Nanji's uh, wonderful work, uh, Nizar Ismaili tradition, uh, Professor Sani talks about this. Um, uh, they have Jamaat Khana as the house of congregation. Um, their literature, poetic, lyrical literature uh, called Ginan uh, is generally documented in Kochki script, which is believed to be known to or can be deciphered by only Kojas, uh, ya Kojiki from Koja, uh, <clears throat> a secretive. It's not so secretive, by the way. Quite a few people can read that. Uh, most Sindhis can easily read that. Um, uh, Luhana especially. Uh, so it's it's a trading caste of Sindh and Gujarat, uh, principally Luhanas and Bhatias. Um, Upon their, it is believed that upon their joining Satpant uh, or this new uh, path, uh, you know, like Santpat, Nathpat, all other paths, uh, Satpant, uh, it is believed that Prisadadin gave them a title of Khwaja. <clears throat> and like we abbreviate the abbreviations, right? Uh, we in Bombayites are known for that and Indians are known for that. Um, Khwaja became Koja. That's most popularly believed thing, right? Um, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, Ali also, uh, Professor Sani also quotes uh, Ivano, a very famous Ismaili scholar. I mean, a scholar, Russian scholar who studied Ismaili philosophy, not Ismaili. He was not an Ismaili, he was a Russian. Um, yeah, he, he, he calls Ismailis uh, tr transition between Ismailism, Sufism, and Hinduism. He talks about, you know, a group of people, community, uh, which has, Sufi ideas, Ismaili ideas, Hindu ideas, and all kind of gets merged into this. Um, one of the questions that was thrown to me by, uh, by my ex-colleague from Itreb, India, um, by the way, my education was in Asia as well. I think Suki mentioned Europe and North America, I, I, Asia as well. And I had South Asian studies, not South Indian studies. I come from South India, I had South Asian studies. Um, so uh, let's, Let's answer that question. So one of the colleagues asked, when did they arrive in Mumbai? Um, there is kind of popular belief that with the arrival of Aga Khan, Khoja started settling in, Aga, uh, in Bombay. No, Aga Khan decided to settle in Bombay because Khojas were there. <clears throat> There's a difference between the logic there. Okay, it's not uh, the other way around. Uh, you know, Khojas were already there in Mumbai and in, they were there much before Aga Khan arrived. By the way, Aga the first Aga Khan arrived uh, in Mumbai in 1846. Then he was sent to Calcutta by the Britishers. And then he came back from Calcutta to Bombay in 1848, end of 1848. Uh, so Khojas were there much before that, okay? And there are multiple theories, but I have a documentary evidence from a court case 
which talks about a prayer space uh, existing on Kharak in 1790s. Okay, so there was there was a Jamaat Khana on Kharak in 1790s. So Kojas were there. Jamaat Khana didn't exist in isolation. There were, and there was a Musafir Khana as well. <coughs> um, <clears throat> Some scholars have recently taken the connection back to Portuguese Mumbai. Now, when you talk about Portuguese Mumbai, you're talking about the 16th century Mumbai, because you know that Portuguese were kind enough to donate Mumbai to Britishers as in dowry. <clears throat> so if you don't know Bombay history, just go back, Mumbai history, then go back and look at that. But uh, before it became a British colony, it was uh, in the hands of Portuguese people. And that's where you, you see this wonderful kind of coastline, you know, um, uh, uh, ports and, you know, buildings, uh, you know, we have this, uh, uh, art, you know, um, uh, even Mahim, if you go to, you, you, you would see some, uh, or Bandra, you would see Portuguese uh, influence. Um, if you want to really kind of, this is now for <clears throat> my academic audience those who want to really study. There's a beautiful book uh, called Ocean of Thread. It, it's, it's focused on Banyas or Vanyas, uh, but it does talk like throughout the book, it talks about Khojas, Memans, Boras. Almost you would find, you know, every time he mentions uh, Khoja, he mentions Bohra, he mentions Meman. <clears throat> and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Of course it covers, uh, period between 1750 and 1850. So it doesn't really go back to the period that I'm talking about, but he does mention that there was a connection. I've put a quotation there, but if you want to, if you get a chance, please read it. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> my research clearly shows that, you know, the settlement was there from earlier times, but a major influx was in 1850s. And that's why people say that, oh, with the arrival of Aga Khan, the numbers increased. Maybe Aga Khan told them to come and settle in Mumbai. Um, I think we, we sometimes give a bit more credit to such events when we are looking inward. We need to look at what is happening in the environment. And one thing that is happening in the environment is the railroads. And I'm sure all of you know this. I mean, especially I see that out of 165, 66 people here, um, 80 people are from Mumbai. <clears throat> and, and you know about the first railway between Bori Bandar and Thana. Anybody remembers the date, 1853? That was the first rail route. And then it was extended to various parts via Kalyan and Virar. And then we had the rail network across India. And that was, uh, that's a British legacy, by the way. You know, uh, we, we have not, uh, kind of uh, built rail network as fast as they managed to build it. The Basar Bridge on Godavari was uh, was one such bridge that they had built. I come from Dharmabad, so Basar, Saraswati Mandir, uh, you know, Jatra, that's where I used to go to. Um, major settlement from uh, early 1850s, but that's where I want to talk about railways and influence of railways. So I want to give the credit to... Um, what Ian Kerr uh, talks about, uh, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic transformation of the nation through railroads is what she discusses. <clears throat> and, and I personally believe in, in, in that story. So let's talk about Koja's three groups that I've been talking about, right? I've been mentioning. <clears throat> so there are three groups, the Sunnis, Ishnasharis, and Koja Ismailis. I want to talk about Koja Sunnis. Um, to start with, because um, as early as 1850, they had their separate Kabristan. Interestingly, if you go and see the Dongri Khoja Kabristan, a corner has been separated. <clears throat> it's cordoned. There is a wall which separates, but it's a piece of the same. You know, if you look at a satellite image or you look at the municipal records, it was the same large plot, Khoja Kabristan. It has an entrance from next to, you know, in the line of Ajwa. Uh, if you go further down, you, you, you have uh, entrance to the Kabristan. That's what the Nizari Ismailis use. Um, but there is also um, an entrance in the alley, side <clears throat> alley, uh, where there is a Siddhi sign as well. 
and and that's where you see Khoja Sunnat Jamaat Kabrastan, uh, and and yes, uh, they 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 there was as early as 1829 there was a case filed. In fact, the struggle started in 1820s. In fact, 1820s, um, Aga Khan first sent his mother to India to settle the dispute. And she came and filed a case in 1829. The case was withdrawn. <clears throat> the people, the Barbhayas, 12 brothers, as they were called, they were not just 12, they were, the, the group was slightly larger, but they were called Barbhayas. They, they, they were excommunicated. They were re-entered on paying the due. It was all about the due, apparently, but also about uh, a very important issue. And I'll be talking about it in the next uh, slide. <clears throat> uh, if you want to quickly know about, and I must thank uh, uh, an informer and a good friend from Toronto. Uh, I think she's on the call, but uh, I have not seen the name, so I don't want to guesswork on this. Um, there are only three uh, prayer spaces of Khoja Sunnis in the world. <clears throat> um, the prayer space is still called Jamaat Khana, by the way. Uh, so these are Khoja Sunnis, but they refer to their spaces as Jamaat Khana, like uh, Koja Ismailis. Uh, the three spaces are located, two of them are located in Mumbai, uh, one in Bandra, one in Varsova. The third one is in Karachi. Currently, there is a large uh, Koja Sunni population in Toronto. They gather, but they don't have a dedicated space. <clears throat> so that's Koja Sunnis for you. If you want to know what uh, fiqh they follow, they fo follow Hanafi fiqh. I don't have the time to explain what is fiqh, what is Sharia. Uh, but they follow Hanafi fiqh for those who understand it. Um, the, the, the oldest of the Jamaat Khana, Sunni Khoja Jamaat Khana, uh, and because you guys are interested in heritage and khaki uh, talks are about heritage, <clears throat> the oldest of this Jamaat Khana is within a few meters, well, few hundred meters of Bandra Bazar Khoja Jamaat Khana, Ismaili Jamaat Khana. And it's called Sonbai Hall and Jamaat Khana. So it says Sonbai Sunni. <coughs> Last time when I visited, it said Sonbai Sunni, Jamaat Khana, and Hall. So <coughs> they use the hall for social gathering as well. I think that's enough for Sunnis, but let me go back. And the reason I, you know, because Sometimes we overemphasize court cases and we believe that court cases define the identities. And in 1860, you get Khoja Sunnis and Khoja, you know, others. And then 1908, you get Khoja Ishnasharis or 1905, you get Khoja Ishnasharis. I want to talk about the social phenomenon that kind of leads to such, such kind of separations or such, uh, <clears throat> you know, court disputes which then gets, it, it hardens the identities, but identities get formed over, over a period, okay? So I don't want to make it complicated here um, because, but you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> so uh, let me just quickly give you a quote. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Nile Green, a very, very famous uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun scholar at uh, California. Um, he's written a book called Bombay Islam. If you're not read it, read it. It's a beautiful book. And he says that as early as the 1830s, you know, some Satyas um, <clears throat> had started separating themselves from the Ismaili Imams. He names uh, Habib Ibrahim, Daya Muhammad. And he says that these, were, these guys were reformist. And they were, uh, they were talking about, um, you know, Muslim women's Education, uh, and I've underlined the sentence for you, your ready reference. Um, particular emphasis on the education of Khoja women. Now, you need to understand that there were multiple cases in the court, British courts about the inheritance dispute. And Islam allows a woman to inherit from the father, but according to Hindu law, a daughter gets inheritance as part of the hedge and thus is not entitled to the inheritance. So, I mean, I'm summarizing, generalizing, I understand that, but we don't have the time to get into the details. So, so those were the laws being applied to the Khojas because they were, uh, you know, the, the, the origin was Lohanas and Bhatias, right? I mean, don't forget that they had come from Sindh and Gujarat and Kutch. <clears throat> Sindh and Kutch was the same region. 
mentioned before partition. Anyways, coming back to uh, uh, this, this whole idea that uh, Nile Green is talking about. So these guys were active from as early as 1830s. But of course, then there is a case, a very famous case called uh, uh, Aga Khan case of 1866. And you can Google this. You can find out uh, the complete uh, uh, <clears throat> court proceedings are available online. And that's where, of course, the identities get hardened. But it all starts much earlier. In fact, uh, my assessment is 1820s, because that's when the first cases are seen in the courts of Bombay. Um, so you know, just to kind of support my claim, uh, I'm trying to make it a little more appealing for the academics and some, some of you who are inquisitive. Uh, you know, this is this is a quote, uh, page 118 uh, from Merchants, trades, Traders and Entrepreneurs. And it says, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's, he, he's talking about uh, uh, Khojas. And he says, in these communities, women did not inherit and a person could bequeath by will the totality of his asset to a person of his own choice. What you need to understand is Islam allows one third of the assets to be <clears throat> allocated, but the rest, there is a proportion in which it gets divided. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. It be, depends on whether you're Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, Maliki, Jafari, each one has a different uh, idea about inheritance, but certainly, women have more rights under those laws than the traditional Indian laws. So, <clears throat> um, so that's the story of Khoja Sunnis, guys. Let's move on to Khoja Ishnasharis. And uh, unfortunately, if some of you have a good image of Khoja uh, Mosque in Palagalli, I would like to have it. I couldn't find a very good image, uh, uh, especially copyright free image. So I had to re rely on this and I don't even know um, who owns the copyright of it. So, um, okay, I brought uh, the image of a Koja, very famous Koja Ishna Sharif, and you all know this guy. <clears throat> and I want you to guess. Anybody knows who this person is? I mean, in a, in a real situation, in a, in a khaki lab environment, I would have the audience and I would ask and I would expect the Jinnah. Response. Yes, thank you very much. Somebody managed to unmute and <laughs> reply. It's Mohammed Ali Jina. Thank you very much. We know him and we see him in this attire, but uh, yeah, that's his Khoja attire. Okay. Um, yeah, he was a barrister. Um, uh, and he was, uh, can anybody recognize this woman from Petit family? Very famous Petit family. Ratan Bai. Ratan Bai. Thank you very much. Ratan Bai Jina. That was the wife of Mamdali Jina. She died pretty young. Um, in fact, she died at the age of 29. And the reason I'm talking about these two guys is because that grave of Ratan Bai is located in Mazgaon at Arambag. That tombstone that you see there is of Ratan Bai. It says 1900 to 1929, you can't read 1929 there, but believe me, it's 1929, okay? And um, now, you know, with every slide, now I'm going to give a homework, okay? Now things are getting a little complicated because I'm here to not only share, but I also am a researcher. I want to know more about things. So there is this tombstone that you can find in the cemetery there. And it talks about late Sir Muhammad Bhai Haji boy. I, I, have, I have very little information about this gentleman and I would want to know more about it, okay? So that's Khoja Ishnashari stories. Let, let's, let's, I mean, we will come back to Khoja Ishnashari's again, okay? Because we need to talk about Haji Bibi case. We have spoken about Aga Khan case of 1866. We need to talk about Haji Bibi case. <clears throat> and I'm conscious of time as well. The image that you see is, um, uh, you see here is uh, of uh, Dongri Kharak Jamaat Khana called Dar Khana, Ismaili Jamaat Khana in Dongri. Um, char, uh, if you take a right turn from Char, well, if you're going from Bindi Bazaar, uh, from Charnal, if you take a right turn on in Pala Gali and go down the road all the way to the corner, Masjid Bandar, you know, before Masjid Bandar, you see this Jamaat Khana. It's a large building. You can't miss it. The tower is visible from far. <clears throat> Um, and we'll come to Darkhana, by the way, again. But this is another image from people who are 
quite a few people from Bandra here, uh, including the relationship uh, relation um, that I spoke about, Dimple Kapadia. Um, uh, this is Bandra Bazar Jamaat Khana. It's an image from 1840s. Uh, it, interestingly, you know, that's, that was my Jamaat Khana when I was in Mumbai uh, till 2012, July 2012. Um, that's when I did my last Imamat day, 11th July. Anyways, uh, coming back to, uh, it still looks the same. It's a heritage building. You may want to go and visit it before it gets, you know, this rapid urbanization that I am not in favor of. And I'm sure a lot of people from Khaki Lab would agree with my <clears throat> observation on this. But uh, before this building disappears, you may want to go and visit this building. Um, not that you know all buildings uh, are going to go down and destroyed. <clears throat> there is a beautiful example here of restoration work of Darkhana Jamaat Khana. This is the same Darkhana Jamaat Khana, which was built in 1914, by the way. I told you that there was a Jamaat Khana in this place much before that from 1790s or much before 1790, but 1914, this particular building was built in 19. 14, the tower that you see was added later on in 1930s by a donor from Africa. But uh, <clears throat> this building has been restored uh, by the, you know, uh, the Aga Khan uh, network, uh, the National Council, uh, Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Uh, they're, they're doing some amazing uh, work in heritage preservation. Go and check Humayun tomb and you know uh, Nizamuddin Basti and Sundarban, Sundarban Nurs Nursery in Delhi, or you go to Kutub Shahi tombs in uh, Hyderabad. Um, <clears throat> there is some amazing work happening there. Look for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and you will come across all these projects that I've spoken about. These are all Indian projects, um, but Darkhana is one uh, uh, brilliant example of such things. Let me let me show a couple of other images of Darkhana. Uh, the first image is this empty prayer space, you know, and very few people have seen it in this form. So I just thought I would bring it. Uh, this is a, this is now 1914 structure, wooden structure, uh, multi-story, can hold thousands of people, uh, and uh, this is uh, the, the the image, uh, you know, courtesy Shamim Padamsi. Uh, this is actually a prayer congregation. Uh, I think the image was taken in 1930s, if I'm not wrong. And you can see the attire, that Koja attire that we talk about, and we didn't have time to talk about dress code, you know. I mean, one can talk about Koja food, Koja attire, we can talk about many things. We can we can have session on Koja Ismailis, Koja Ishnasharis, Koja Sunnis. We can have we can have multiple sessions. This subject is such that we can talk for like hours and hours and hours. But I wanted to introduce three Koja groups and give the historical perspective what led to these three Koja groups. So this is the image which shows the, you know, uh, this is Darkhana that, uh, you know, looked like uh, what it looked like before the complete restoration. This is what it looks like today. Uh, so this is, this is, this is a brilliant job done, you know, one must acknowledge uh, and give the credit where the credit is due. Um, <clears throat> this is Koja Kabrastan. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, if you go in, there is a treasure trove. Uh, this is the tomb uh, image of the tomb of Sir Ibrahim Ramtullah. But just behind, if you go and look carefully, there is a tomb of Sir Tharia Topan. Uh, Sir Tharia Topan, by the way, was uh, uh, the minister in the court of Zanzibar Sultan. So he was, yeah, he had migrated to Zanzibar. Uh, the mother was, if I'm not wrong, the, his wife was from Gwadar. Um, but he came to Bombay and uh, he's buried in, in Dongri, uh, Ismaili, uh, Koja, Kabrastan. And you can see that, you know, Ismaili, Muslim, bracket, Koja, Kabrastan. Uh, uh, so I, I thought I would give you that. And, and you, can, you can recreate some of these stories. We need to capture. Heritage is not about just capturing the buildings, but capturing the stories that go with it. Uh, this is, you know, the image, the reason I brought this image here is uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> the building that you see opposite the tower is called Holy View. And I was visiting a gentleman there who is no more there, you know, Kurban uh, Sariwala. Uh, and, and he narrated a story that when the building was getting constructed, there was a huge row about whether the building can be raised about the height of the Jamaat Khana. Because <clears throat> some Khojas, 
uh, got offended that uh, somebody wanted to build a residential building taller than the prayer house. Uh, so, so these are the stories that we need to capture. And that's why I brought that image. If you are interested in such beautiful buildings, such historic buildings, then a small tour. This is Bandra Yuan. Um, you go to Bandstand, you can see it from the back. But if you go from uh, my book studio, you can see this building. Um, <clears throat> this is the recent addition on the scene. It is Jogeshwari. And I'm not too sure whether this can be called Koja, because I told you that all uh, Ismailis are not Khojas, they are Momen Ismailis as well. This is Jogeshwari Jamaat, which is primarily uh, Momen Jamaat uh, from Sitpur. And this is Purla Jamaat Khana. These are beautiful buildings. <clears throat> not all Jamaat Khanas are beautiful uh, and purpose built. Uh, if you go to Clay Road, this is a chawl. Okay, typical chawl in Bhaikala that has been converted into Jamaat Khana and it has been there for a long time. And this is Aga Hall Jamaat Khana, uh, the Aga Hall state that we are talking about, the redevelopment. Some of you have sent me questions. I will not have time to deal with those questions, but this is another. So coming back to now, it's I'm almost touching. Uh, I'm left with only... Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I should have turned off my volume. Um, uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. So let me quickly give you the story of Aga Khans that many of you wanted to know. <clears throat> this is the first Aga Khan I've already mentioned. He arrived uh, uh, in Bombay, he settled in Bombay in 1848. He's, you know, he, he used to come to Darkhana and have gatherings on Saturdays. Uh, he used to meet uh, Khoja families in, in, um, uh, in uh, Aga Hall, Mazgao area. <clears throat> Uh, this is his autobiography that the, uh, the Institute of Smile Studies has published. Uh, it's called Ibrat. -e the original is Ibrat Afza uh, fa uh, in Farsi. Uh, it was translated in Gujarati as early as 1865. So the Gujarati version is available as well. Uh, recently, the IIS has uh, published this uh, edited version in Farsi and in English translation, but it has a beautiful introduction that gives you the, the kind of landscape of Koja, Mumbai. So that's the book that I wanted to introduce because I don't have time to talk about all of that. But uh, this is Aga Khan II. Uh, he, uh, he was there as the Imam for a very short time. He was, uh, he was found of hunting. He goes for hunting, gets kind of, you know, you know there is heavy rain. Uh, he he, he cap catches pneumonia and dies very young. And a very young son of, him, uh, Aga Khan III becomes uh, the Imam and we will talk about him in, in a few minutes. But uh, I want to talk about this beautiful building that you saw on the poster. Yeah, and somebody just texted me saying, you know, you look very different from the, uh, the photograph that was circulated. Well, didn't you realize that was marketing material? You know, we tried to look, look the best, uh, you know, uh, in the in the picture, yeah, I've grown. Uh, four. That's, a, that's the four-year-old picture, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so coming back to, uh, you know, this, I came across this uh, on the internet. It's called Mini Taj. In fact, I have a you know, newspaper clipping as well. I didn't put it there. It says, Bombay ka apna Taj Mahal. Uh, I think it's from Hindi Milap, if I'm not wrong, but I have the clipping somewhere. So, so it's, it's called Taj Mahal, and it's a beautiful building. Uh, the image courtesy is Samir Nurani, by the way. Um, and um, if you go inside, you will see uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the tomb. Uh, this is actually not the actual grave of uh, the first Aga Khan. He's buried under. So if you're lucky, you can go inside uh, below the platform and the graves are below. <clears throat> you know, uh, and when I was talking about Bollywood connection, somebody's texted saying, is Salman Khan uh, Ismaili? No. Uh, Salman Khan and Ali Morani has worked with Amir Khan, but Amir Khan is not Ismaili and Shah Rukh Khan is not Ismaili. But there are Khans who are, uh, you know, who had, you know, kind of Ismaili connection. That's Piroz Khan and uh, uh, Sanjay Khan. Uh, they, they are Iranians who are related to Aga Khan. And, uh, and uh, they, their ancestors are also buried in this, this complex, uh, you know, film, Bollywood, uh, Firoz Khan and Sanjay Khan. So if you want to go and visit and, you know, for whatever interest, this is a beautiful building to visit. It's in Mazdao. Uh, 
but I just wanted to talk about these couple of things for you to know that there is a lot to this, you know, kind of find out about these buildings. You just can't walk in and assume that because you've seen this green kind of, you know, uh, kind of chadar, uh, it's a tomb. It's not a tomb. Tomb is below, okay, the, the platform. Uh, but coming back to uh, many such things we can discuss about this building. So this is Aga Khan. I'm, I've got eight minutes left, sorry. Um, and he was a young uh, person, seven years old. He became the imam, but he lived for the longest, uh, to enjoy the longest uh, um, reign uh, of any imam, uh, 72 years. Uh, he celebrated golden jubilee, diamond jubilee, and platinum jubilee of his, uh, what is, you know, Khoja Ismail is called Imam Mat, uh, that's being imam. And um, uh, we can uh, avoid talking much about him, but I want to, you know, in fact, I want to talk about his contribution in the context of monuments that you can go and visit. Um, and I want to use the current context to talk about it. In fact, I delivered a talk two months ago at uh, South Asia Cinema Foundation. Uh, some Bollywood guys are here. Uh, I delivered a talk at South Asia Cinema Foundation on Aga Khan III. And the, I'm using two slides from there. Um, the current context of pandemic, this becomes very relevant. Uh, we are talking about in, you know, uh, this pandemic uh, of uh, plague and anti-plague vaccine. And you know that Hafkin was the person who is credited for uh, uh, inventing the plague vaccine. And you would be surprised, you know, like in those days, India exported 26 million doses. So it's not only COVID vaccine that we are exporting, guys. We, we have been saving the world since uh, early 20th century or late 19th century, actually. Um, but the story that I want to narrate here is, uh, you know, he was facing difficulties. British government was not willing, well, not ready. They had given him a very small space. He could not establish his library. And he mentions in his uh, kind of letters that a person called Aga Khan III came forward and gave a building called Khusro Lodge. Um, and the article that I read says the bungalow was fitted up at the Aga Khan's expense for Hafkin's use. So the, 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 you see Hafkin researching, it is at um, Khusro Lodge and Khusro Lodge, uh, again, uh, you know, I must thank uh, Vinayak Talwar, uh, who is a volunteer of Khaki to, to let me know that uh, it's part of St. Mary's School in Mazgaon. Uh, Khusro Lodge is still existing and I would love to visit that next time when I'm in Mumbai. But, you know, this is uh, Aga Khan III saying that, you know, people were dying like flies and I, I kind of threw, uh, I gave the, the, the biggest ever kind of, you know, biggest property I had access to, to Hopkin for his research laboratory. Uh, one of my biggest houses, a vast rambling palace, not far from Aga Hall. And I always wondered where this is. You know, he says that it's not from very far from Aga Hall state, but where is it? <clears throat> but this Khusro Lodge is uh, part of St. Mary's now. Uh, yes, so Khojas were like a trader's guild, a caste, and they were all one and they separated. And we've spoken about Haji Bibi, I mean, uh, Aga Khan case of 1866. One case that gets spoken about is the Haji Bibi case. And these are the document, court documents. Uh, Justice Russell gave the verdict. Uh, Haji Bibi was the cousin of uh, Aga Khan III, Sultan Muhammad Shah. And um, uh, you know, uh, she did file a case and she lost it. And, uh, you know, Ismailis in 1866 were called Ismailis. By the way, the Aga Khan case uh, said that they are not Sunnis and they clearly defined uh, the group as Shia Ismailis. So that was Justice Arnold in 1866 defined them as uh, Ismailis. And here in 1905, the case was filed. The judgment comes in 1908. You can see those dates on the, on the document. Uh, they had the shared practices. So you, you talk about Ibrat Afza and you talk about Muharram, process, you know, Muharram practices. Yes, Imams did practice. Uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, but the relationship started deteriorating in 1870s. In fact, 1873, there was Mullah Qadir Hussain who was sent by Ayatollah Mazandarani from Iran. Uh, he, this was the person who was in, in, in Mumbai in uh, 1860s. And then he went to Africa and then he went to meet... Uh, uh, you know, uh, he went from Ziyara to Iran and there he met Ayatollah Mazandarani. So we are now talking about Khoja, 
uh, Ishna Sharif, uh, you know. So he went there. He came back in 1873 to Mumbai and he started preaching Ishna Shari uh, teachings. He started uh, inviting some Koja families who were already practicing Ishna Shari faith. I'm not suggesting that they were not, uh, and started kind of talking about Ishna Sharif. Uh, by 18, 1881, we had the mosque in Zanzibar, Koja Ishna Shari Mosque. So you already have this clear distinction. It's not 1905 or 1908 that defines Khoja Ishnasharis. It starts from 1870s. And by 1900, you have the first, uh, 1901, you had the Khoja Ishnashari Mosque in Dongri. Uh, the, but the, con the communal boundaries were further hardened in 1905 when the case was filed. And 1908, it became very clear. 1910, we see Aga Khan III telling the community not to have the relationship with Ishnasharis. Today, all Koja communities meet each other, stay with each other. We live happily. Uh, we talk to each other. We can converse. In fact, uh, uh, I, I keep talking to Dr. Sadiq Uttanwala for all sorts of things. Uh, and I, you know, we, you know, I, 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 I've gone and met, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Karmali. Um, so, so I, I'm kind of, you know, we, we all live happily as Koja <clears throat> group. Uh, and that's my last slide for the Koja presentation, but this is the help needed. And I'm, I'm happy that uh, Vivek Matai, whose grandfather was the one who signed the constitution of India, by the way, with Nehru. So if you see the picture of uh, you know, the body that signed the constitution, uh, John Matai, his grandson is on the, on the, <clears throat> on the, uh, audio, in the audience. And um, we were struggling with this document. So this is the document between uh, Koja, Mauji Bhai Hirji, uh, and he signed this document with Imam Sultan, His Highness Sultan Muhammad Shah. <clears throat> and we want to know who, the, if anybody in the audience knows uh, Koja Mauji Bhai Hirji. Uh, we have another document that was uh, signed by, of course, uh, very famous Ali Muhammad Rahmatullah Maklai, uh, the president, uh, and Gulam uh, Hussein Merchant, but it was also signed by Gulam Qasim. Mm -hmm. And Gulam Qasim was signing it on behalf of Muk Megji Murji. And we want to know more about uh, these two individuals. So while you have uh, got the knowledge that you needed, and I'm on 59 minutes, uh, I thought I would, uh, I would give you an assignment before saying thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Khaki, and thank you, the audience. Uh, I hope you found the talk useful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank uh, you. So Suki, much. 15 seconds to spare. I have kept my promise. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you for keeping the time. And uh, of course, um, you know, there, there are a lot of questions and a lot of comments about, uh, um, the, about the, you know, uh, people have been conversing with each other and asking and answering questions. So let me, uh, uh, first of all, let me apologize for uh, my slip of the tongue and saying uh, South Indian instead of South Asian. So please accept my... No, you, I was just wondering, you know, how did you manage to find out my origin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about that. No, uh, no, so no, no, no. While you were starting and you were talking about all the uh, Kojas, I think there was, there was uh, Karim Jaria mentioned Aziz Premji, uh, Shazia Remtula mentioned uh, Rafiq Malik of Metro Shoes and... Uh, Suhail Nathani of ELP. Uh, and while Meera Desai commented about Korakiwalas of Fokhat, I think Samira mentioned that uh, Korakiwalas are uh, Dawudi uh, Bohra. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it, in the beginning itself, I think Yogi Raj brought out that Muhammad Ali Jinnah was originally Jinnah, Jinnah Bai, and uh, uh, I, I think people got a hint from there as well. Um, Shazia Rehmtullah also talked about Tariq Karimboy being a well-known architect and sculptor in New York from the Karimboy family that ran the orphanage that you uh, mentioned. Uh, Malik Ladakh talked about uh, Justice Chagla, who was the Chief Justice of uh, Bombay High Court. Um, Arun Gupta has a question. Uh, as to, um, it's, a, it's a dual question. Um, what is a simple difference, he says, between Ismaili, Kojas, Bodhis, and then... Uh, what are the other different Indian Muslim communities? And also, how did Aga Khan become a prince and so rich? Right. Um, so interesting questions. And uh, I did have some of these names that have come up on my list. But 
as we were moving, I decided to cut down some of the names, but uh, I'm happy that those names have come up, uh, you know, just especially Justice Chagla. I mean, you know, that's that's a very important name. And of course, the artist and many other names that have come up. So uh, thank you very much for suggesting those names and, uh, you know, keep posting them to, I don't know, how will you reach me? I think, yeah, the slide that I showed you had my um, email address. It is hsjasani at yahoo.com. H for Harry, S for sugar, Jasani, J-A-S-A-N-I at yahoo.com. Do send me your questions in case I can't answer it, but if, do send me some information, documents, whatever you can to that num uh, that email ID. Um, uh, it's my personal ID. I check it. Uh, my assistant doesn't have access to it, so you can be frank and straight with me on that. Uh, coming back to uh, the question, uh, so difference between various groups, and, and Bohra group is one group that I certainly wanted to talk about, and especially because uh, uh, His Holiness Sayyidna Sahib is online. Uh, I my, my salam and my gratitude for being there. Um, <clears throat> and, and there are many, many Bohra uh, individuals uh, I, I, I recognize, and of course, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the, Jujat Tambawala was one of the persons whom I, in fact, met, and Bilkish is here. Bilkish was the one who introduced me to Juzar, who introduced me to Vinayak, who introduced me to Khaki. This happened in June, and we are in November, and I'm already talking to the Khaki group. So it's it's very fast world that we are now into. Um, but coming back to the differences between these groups, uh, and I mentioned Juzar because Juzar comes from Bora family. So they are Ismailis, we are Ismailis. So amongst Ismailis, we have multiple groups. So we have Suleimani Ismailis, we have Alavi Ismailis, we have Daudi Bora, <clears throat> uh, 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 you know, current uh, majority group, but we also have Kutubi Bohras who separated recently from the main branch. <clears throat> um, so we have multiple Mustalvi Ismaili groups, but we also have Suleimani Ismailis. So very famous MF Hussein, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether Najma Hussain is online. Uh, I think, I don't know whether I shared my uh, kind of talk, uh, the daughter-in-law of uh, M.F. Hussain. Uh, they are Suleimani Ismailis. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so so we have, amongst Ismailis, we have multiple groups. So first, first you need to understand that Shias believe in the Imam. Uh, now, Ishnashari's believe in 12 Imams. So after the 12th Imam, they believe that their Imam is uh, going to now reappear as Mahdi on the day of judgment or the Qiyama as Arabic, in Arabic we call it, on the day of Qiyama. Um, and I'm, you, are, you can understand that religious beliefs and practices can't be summarized in one sentences. I'm obviously kind of simplifying this for the audience. So that's Ishnashari group. And against amongst Ishnasharis, there are subgroups, but let's not get there. Let's look at Ismailis. So amongst Ismailis, you have Bohra Ismailis. Amongst Bohra Ismailis, you have Suleimanis, Alavis, Kutubis, Daudis, uh, I mean, uh, the current, uh, uh, you know, Sayyidina Saifuddin's group. Um, so, so those are subgroups of, and of course they have reformists, they have Mahdi Bhagwalas, they have, um, you know, so there is, there, is, there, is a, there is a large diversity. And we need to understand that. I started by saying that all Ismailis are not Kojas. Amongst Kojas, we have Momnas, we have uh, you know, Sipuri moments, Ka Kachawari moments, but we also have Shamshis, we have so Punjabi uh, sheikhs. Uh, you know, so we have, I think, Farah Sheikh on the call, Musa Sheikh, they are from Punjab. Uh, they, are, they are Ismailis, but they're not Koja Ismailis. So, so you know, amongst, we are called uh, the the Koja Ismailis are Nizari Ismailis. And you must have noticed me saying Nizari Ismaili Kabrastan. The reason I say that is because there was a Fatimid rule in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, about 13th century, uh, there was a split. Uh, some people believed in uh, Imam Mustali and they became Mustalvis or Bohras. And some people believed in the elders and Nizar and they are called Nizaris. And it is believed by the Koja Ismailis that uh, Imam Nizar moved to Iran uh, and or his, his kind of, uh, his heir moved to, uh, uh, to Iran. And that line continued uh, in Iran and Aga Khan was from the same, uh, gen you know, so Aga Khan's genealogy goes back to Imam Nizar and Imam Mustan Sirbillah and uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq and Imam Ali, who was the son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad. So that's the Ismaili Nizari line. 
and Aga Khan first claimed to be from that line. Now, amongst Nizaris, we have Mama Shahis and Kasim Shahis, and we can get into all sorts of, but we can have a separate kind of conversation on that. So just to give you a short answer, these are various Shia groups. They believe in a living authority to be their spiritual head who guides them. Uh, Bohra groups get guided by Dayol Matlak, which, uh, uh, which who, who claims to be the representative uh, <clears throat> of the Imam uh, who, who, who gets inspired and guides the community. Nizari Ismail is believed that they have the 49th Imam, uh, His Highness Aga Khan IV, who happens to be the grandson of the third Aga Khan that we discussed today. So, so that's, that's the Nizari branch. Now, Sunnis and Shias, we don't have the time for. You know, that's a larger group. So majority of the Muslims are Sunnis, about 15%, 12 to 15% are Shias, out of which the Ismailis are the minority uh, group amongst is, uh, Ismailis, then we have Nizari and other groups, and, and, and we can get going with it. But amongst three Koja groups that I mentioned, the smallest number is Koja Sunnis, and then Koja Ishnasharis, and Koja Ismailis is the largest of the Koja groups. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that uh, casts a lot of light on the uh, origins of the community. Arun has a very simple question again. Uh, what is a Jamaat Khana? And he also wants to know whether Dimple is a Muslim or a Koja or a Hindu, and he's confused. So you'd care to yeah. eliminate that. So, um, okay, so two, three things. Well, well, you know, first, I didn't answer the question how His Highness became rich and all that, but uh, His Highness was always, he was a, you know, he, he was ruling a province. Uh, so his ancestors ruled <clears throat> vast, uh, you know, there was a time when there was a khutbah, a Friday khutbah, recited in the name of Fatimid Caliph in Mecca and Medina. So, so they they were emperors. So he he his genealogy goes back to that. They had the uh, they were ruling uh, part of Persia, current day Iran. <clears throat> if you come recently, then Aga Khan first father Khalilullah was ruling. He was the governor of uh, Kahrawan. Uh, Mahalat and Kahrawan region uh, in Iran was governed by. And, and of course, they were married uh, to the princess. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, I mean princess uh, from the Iran, Iran's ruling family, Qajars. So Fateli Shah Qajar's daughter was married to one of the Aga Khans. And that's how, uh, you know, the present uh, Aga Khan traces his, you know, uh, kind of royal uh, blood from both sides, from mother's side, but for, uh, I mean, uh, from great grandmother's side, but also from, uh, from father's side. Mm -hmm. And Britishers acknowledged their right to be called His Highness. So the HH that goes with Aga Khan is His Highness, not His Holiness. Sometimes people confuse it with His Holiness, but he, this is a royal title. So all rulers like Baroda, uh, ruler would be called, uh, you know, Her Highness, kind of current, uh, uh, you know, um, and similarly, various uh, monarchs from various principalities in India are called His Highness, and Aga Khan was one such person who was uh, given this uh, honor by the British government, and the British government continued that honor to the current Aga Khan when he became the Imam in 18, 1957. He was 21 when his uh, grandfather passed away and he became the Imam. He was still studying at Harvard. He had not completed his degree, but he was called His Highness by the British uh, monarch. And that's how he's styled as His Highness. Um, and of course, because he comes from that background, uh, it's not the community fund who, which makes him rich. Uh, he, he, is, uh, he's, he comes from the royal family, so he's rich in that sense. And uh, he, he's, a, he, he's got many, many businesses that he runs, which makes him a lot of money. Now, coming back to Jamaat Khana. Jamaat Khana is a place of congregation that uh, especially Khoja Ismailis use. use. Um, and this is, this is a community, community center. So if you recently, you, you hear of Ismaili centers. And, uh, and, and this is where the community gathers. Uh, it, it has both prayer space, but also social. It serves as a social gathering space as well. So sometimes weddings are performed there, you know, uh, celebrations are organized there, uh, but also educational activities conducted there and a lot of uh, charity work takes place. So if you go to the AKDN or the dot Ismaili and you look at 
you know, uh, um, the work that the community is doing, a lot of it gets uh, uh, disseminated through the, the place called Jamaat Khana. Uh, so it's a Farsi word, Jamaat means community, Khana means a hall, uh, a place where Jamaat Khana means. It's used by the Chishtis as well. Uh, the Nizamuddin uh, uh, bus, uh, you know, this Khwaza Nizamuddin's uh, uh, shrine uh, in Delhi, in Nizamuddin Basti, is called Nizamuddin uh, uh, Jamaat Khana as well. Uh, it's a Chishti Jamaat Khana. But Jamaat Khana itself is a topic in itself. We can talk about it, but it's a, it's a Sufi space as well. Uh, Bohras have Jamaat Khana, but that's used for social function. As I said, Sunni Khojas use Jamaat Khana, which has both prayer space and social gathering space. Uh, some Ishnashari communities still maintain a social gathering space called Jamaat Khana, but mostly it's now been replaced by you know, some, some name uh, other than Jamaat Khana to distinguish that space from Khoja Ismaili and Khoja Sunni space. So that's Jamaat Khana. Uh, and what was one more short question you said? The other one was whether Dimple is a Muslim or a Khoja. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, right. So Dimple comes from a family who was Khoja. I don't know whether she still practices it. I, 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 I do remember kind of somebody mentioning that, you know, a few decades ago, she was seen in one of the Jamaat Khanas. Uh, she used to, I guess, come to Santa Cruz Jamaat Khana. So people may know more about that. But as a child, I always learned uh, from my father because my father was a good friend of Chuni Bhai Kapadia. And, you know, that, I mean, they were business partners. Uh, so that's how uh, I knew that they had Koja connection. And, and that's why I mentioned that name. But it was more to kind of establish that there are enough uh, Bollywood uh, people there. And, um, you know, uh, it's... So Samira is mentioning that Dimple's mother was Koja Ishmaili, according to Yeah. So that's the, from mother's side, from Chotila, that she's... Uh, so I know a like, lot more details, but it's personal. So I'm dropping that here. Uh, but yeah, she had some Koja connection. <clears throat> Adil has a question whether the... Uh, he wants to know how old is a Koja Jamaat Khana in Mahim? And were there many Khojas in the Kapad Bazaar area and was there any relation with the business of sen selling clothes there? So, um, yes, so two, three things. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, bringing Mahim Jamaat Khana. So Mahim Jamaat Khana is one of the earliest Jamaat Khanas uh, and that requires complete documentation. So in one of the reports that I have prepared um, for internal use, I have highlighted that this Jamaat Khana requires, so Bandra Bazaar Jamaat Khana, Thana, uh, not the current Jamaat Khana, current Jamaat Khana uh, stands on uh, the ground that had an earlier structure. And I'm referring to that earlier structure. That's a pretty old structure. So these are very old Jamaat Khanas. And whether, whether Khojas were in uh, trading, uh, cloth trading, yes, many Khojas, both in India and East Africa, were into trading cloth. <clears throat> so that is an obvious connection. And yeah, you know that Mahim Jamaat Khana is located in Kapar Bazaar, uh, Kapra Bazaar or whatever that's called. You know, I, I actually lived in that uh, compound for initially when joined, I, I joined Itrib India, I was uh, given the accommodation in Mahim um, Chol. Uh, it was a house that belonged to S.V. Nur Muhammad, uh, that Sultan V. Nur Muhammad. And uh, I, I lived in that, uh, that uh, room for some time. I also claim to have lived in Daud Fazal because when I got married, Tarika Bod gave me a room in Daud Fazal uh, building in Dongri and I lived there for, uh, for, for a short period, but I did live there. So, so I am connected to this Khoja kind of circle, but coming back to Mahim Jamaat Khana. So this Kapar Bazaar Jamaat Khana, yes, that's one of the oldest and, and, and it's worth kind of, you know, there is a lot of history, not always very nice history. Some murders took place, you know, so when the Ishnashari Khoja Mosque was built, there were some murders. Uh, but earlier in Mahim Jamaat Khana itself, there was a murder and, you know, uh, the, the, the Jamaat Khana floors were divided between Sunnis and uh, non-Sunnis uh, okay. by the court. So, so there is a rich history attached to Mahim Jamaat Khana as well. And that requires capturing. But yes, it's, it's one of the oldest Jamaat Khanas. I don't exactly know the date, but uh, I have it somewhere. Okay. But it, it must be over uh, about that period, 100 year old. You mentioned the Qutub Shahi tombs and uh, Raghu mentioned that they're doing some phenomenal work in their restoration and they look great. Uh, Vinayak had a question whether uh, 
uh, you know, whether there are heritage walks that happen at Darkhana Jamatkhana and whether we can access them. So uh, for a long time, there was a restor restoration work that was going on, uh, right. Vinayak. And so there were no, uh, because it was a construction site, almost like difficult to access uh, various areas. But from what I understand, and uh, I, I know that uh, Council for India representatives are here, uh, some of them, and uh, they would be able to tell you this, but I'm sure, you know, um, accessing that site now should be easier because uh, uh, more or less the work is, uh, I'm, uh, from what I understand, is almost coming to an end or has already come to an end. Uh, but if it's a construction site, then it would be difficult. My, my yes. understanding is once that work is over, then certainly. Um, We'd love I'm, to know more about uh, that. Yes. In, in fact, they have uh, they have a, a brilliant uh, um, yeah they have developed a tour script that you know they can use to kind of talk to people who come to visit it. So I know that there was some work going on on that front. Okay, uh, Samira also mentioned that uh, um, some of the money that was raised from Aga Khan's uh, Golden Jubilee function, Aga Khan Three's uh, Golden Jubilee function. Was it uh, used to fund the Golden Jubilee School at Dongri? So uh, Diamond Jubilee funds were used for Diamond Jubilee School. It's called the Diamond Jubilee School, not Golden Jubilee School. Oh. But yes, it was used. But interestingly, you know, I, one question that I had in the presentation I didn't ask is what is the similarity between Sidnam College, um, Hindu Vishwa uh, Vidyapit, uh, Banaras uh, Vishwa Vidyapit, uh, Aligarh University, and Ferguson College? And, and one common thing amongst all four is His Highness uh, Aga Khan the uh, Third. He had donated to all four institutions. Okay. Uh, Aga Khan Third had institutionalized a scholarship in Sanskrit. Okay, so so that's uh, that's another interesting uh, piece that you know we India was pluralistic, diverse, and always we all lived happily together, and that's that's the beauty of that place. Khoja Ishnasharis, Khoja uh, Sunnis, and Khoja Ismailis had their differences, but then there was a time when they were all together, and there is again a time when they all, you know, they all can talk to each other. So I think that's the beauty of uh, of the Indian culture, and uh, and I'm I'm so happy that you know today we have Khaki Tours, uh, a brilliant initiative. I'm so happy, and uh, you know that's why uh, you know I told Diksha that you know use the money for for the cause. You need more money, we can. You know, look at that, but uh, my honorarium can certainly go to Khaki tours. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I think we we need to do this. Uh, we need to do this. You know, we don't look at. I mean, Vinayak, uh, you know, uh, Juzar, you know, Farooq, uh, you know, Doctor Sadiq, and then Suki, and you know, uh, we all belong to kind of different faiths, and and we all can sit around the table and talk. I mean, what else do you need? Brilliant job. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we all wish that more people would uh, think like that and the world would be a better place. Um, Yogi Raj had a question. Uh, do Lohanas, were many Lohanas or Pujas uh, practicing any Hindu customs? Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, your question is, Pujas follow any Hindu custom? So I, I don't even know what can be called. I mean, like the category Hindu is, is pretty recent. You know that it's a gift of Britishers, right? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing called the Hindu as such. So these were cultural context, like cultural aspects, you know? So South looks very different from North and West looks very different from the East. So Bengali customs are very different and, you know, um, uh, Western Gujarati and Kachi customs are very different. Our food is different. Food changes every few, literally, you know, kind of 10 miles, you see new dish getting added in India. Uh, so, yes, you know, you see the cultural influence of Gujarat and Sindh in the practices. That's what I would say. <clears throat> so, Indic influence is certainly there. So, at the marriage ceremony, you would see pity, haldi. Now, you would not find you know, if you go to Middle East and talk about nikah and marriage and Muslim marriage, I don't think they would understand what Haldi means. But I'm going to a wedding in the US in December, and they already sent me a schedule. 
and it has you know one function called haldi pithi and and a lot of attempt to explain what it means and then now there is another as thing added to it called dirty pithi dirty haldi i mean that's a messy haldi that you know they have but coming back to yes so we do have those practices in terms of religious practices i guess some of the symbols are very universal like water purity you know purification symbol is is quite uh, universal um, so so there is a ginan which says gat ganga tirath mahe nahi hai gat ganga tirath no tirath ganga these are indic vocabulary right holy river you know going to the to the ghat and taking a dip in the water now that kind of stuff is discussed and talked about and it's performed symbolically by drinking water but then drinking water is common amongst muslims you know and christians and you know hindus and many other faiths so so there are indic practices that are part of the the more or less cultural practices so you know lot of you know birth related you know some some people still do chatti uh, which is which is a very kind of unique ceremony to the indian people we understand what what is this chatti you know bhagya vidata coming and writing the bhagya of a child uh, you keep a paper and a pen on the sixth day some some gujarati still do it uh, so so those kind of ceremonies are still performed by some now ask me when i got married i didn't do haldi okay because uh, you know i was scared of somebody coming and kind of rubbing something on my face and uh, and i don't allow anybody but my wife to touch my body and that itself is uh, kind of you know uh, a very kind of scary experience that somebody can come and kind of uh, do whatever they want to do with you uh, is just not my way of doing it and uh, so i didn't so so i'm not suggesting that every smiley does it uh, i'm not suggesting that <laughs> people don't do it uh, these are cultural practices and they become very strong when you get out of the environment right when you are outside hindustan hindustan becomes more important uh, you know i don't want to sound like shahrukh khan and amrish puri but uh, or sorry uh, who was this uh, yeah amrish puri i guess in that uh, hindi movie where they are in trafalgar square uh, you know feeding pigeons and singing a song uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah we miss india more than you guys uh, can imagine okay See, you know the uh, the chat is uh, consistently being filled with more and more compliments about your talk and uh, a lot of questions and as uh, i realize uh, just like many other people do is that sometimes talks like this uh, don't just answer a few questions but raise a hundred more and it encourages you to go out and read some of the books that you've uh, mentioned and some of the sites that you've mentioned so uh, really it invigorates your interest so in the interest of time i'm going to have to uh, stop asking questions but before you go i'd like to um, invite uh, uh, you know of course i'd like to thank you very much for such an interesting uh, uh, talk but i'd like to invite uh, bharat kotoskar our founder to um, speak a few words with you before before you get in uh, sure. i mean congratulations amazing organization you Uh, and i've seen your videos and uh, you know uh, this is this is brilliant uh, but you know i just want to acknowledge chairman rafiq uh, thank you for mentioning dandias so we do play dandia uh, you know this garba dandia kind of thing is very common amongst ismailis on all occasions we just look for an occasion and music and we start playing dandias okay so that's one thing and you know many of us go to navratri just to play dandia uh, so that's one and uh, uh, you know uh, arnavas Uh, Kharas has highlighted that Parsis also have chatti custom, uh, which is which is like that's where Parsis were from, you know, kind of Gujarat Surat connection, so Gujarati connection, and uh, and that itself is a topic by the way, Parsi Khoja connection. There is a PhD uh, that uh, you know currently going on uh, on 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 that relationship. So, inshallah, someday. Thank you, Bhargav. Sorry, I I yeah, kind of yeah. interrupted. Bhargav, what do you think? yeah so it was such a pleasure to go through your presentation because you know uh, most people general people look at muslims as one huge mass uh, of population which is of only one shade right and the more and more you try to understand you realize that you know first khojas then within khojas multiple communities then breakaway groups so it's so fascinating to look at and more and more as we start uh, deciphering the area of dongri 
more such jewels keep on coming out and we want to reveal it to the world because you know uh, um, there are thousands of colors you know and uh, we are looking at only one shade which is sad so it it it's just adds talks like these add to the kaleidoscope which is mumbai yeah and beyond mumbai also so thank you for such a wonderful talk and i hope uh, we will do some workshop at some point of time when you are in mumbai at a later date where people can engage okay. on greater detail i'm i'm really happy that such a large crowd gathered across the world yeah and uh, i think so at one point it crossed once it was 160 plus so i i'm i'm really thankful and i i am sure in course of time we'll be able to put this uh, uh, on youtube so that more and more people will eventually be able to appreciate the knowledge that has been shared here thank you thank Over you sukhi Thank you so much, and uh, thank you everyone for spending your Saturday evening uh, with us. And uh, we'll see you here next week again. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.